And it's appropriate, of course, that Ken is having an event at Titanic, which is a great bar, but his, you know, his campaign's a sinking ship. So, Are you ready? dad jokes. Are you ready? <laughs> ready, I thought. <laughs> ready, I thought we were doing it. I thought we were doing the thing. We've already started. We started with, we started with a cold open of you <laughs> you typing at your computer and saying, I finally won something. I got Ken Russell in trouble. There's a cease and desist. This this passes for a great victory for Billy Corbin. All I do is lose, 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 no matter what, Dan. All right, we'll start there then. You've been wanting to talk about Ken Russell for many, many weeks now. <laughs> I and, haven't wanted to. <laughs> and you and then we keep talking about other things and don't end up talking about Ken Russell. So before we get to Esther Alonzo and the awful thing happening to her, the human thing happening to her as government run amok, corruption run amok in Virginia Key ends up swallowing a woman who doesn't deserve to be swallowed. And before we get to Fernand Amandi and he tells us what, uh, how to vote, what's happening with the polling numbers and what it is that we're headed toward next week with a big week of voting. Before we do that, Let's get to Ken Russell finally after three weeks of ignoring him. Your nemesis, Ken Russell. Where are we with him? Such a putz. I mean, this guy, it's just like he just can't get out of his own way. It's, just, it's amateur hour. It's clown town. It's silly season. It's because Miami. I mean, he's just, he, he's been a terrible city commissioner for seven years. This is a guy, Dan, who never voted in an election before until his name was on the ballot. That's what kind of narcissist ego case we're dealing with here and he's running this congressional campaign that is not a campaign but it is just a pure ego feeding quid pro quo for his corrupt vote on the mel reese uh real estate hustle on the uh you know the soccer stadium shopping mall he was hotel against it he was park. against it he was against it and then when he was the deciding vote he caved he caved for nothing he came for he got nothing that he wa- said he wanted, nothing he claimed he was holding out for. He just all of a sudden caved. And why did he cave? He caved because Francis Suarez promised to help to pay him back through this congr- congressional campaign, through donations that he can have his way with. And what he's doing is so destructive because he's doing it purely for his ego. He's got a Republican mayor who's, quote unquote, helping him by calling people up, shaking them down. Because the guy's a sitting commissioner and Francis is the mayor and basically saying, you want to do business with the city, you better pay up. You better, quote unquote, donate, basically bribe Ken Russell by donating to his campaign. Otherwise, you're screwed with city business. So these are lobbyists and vendors and contractors and special interests with business before the city who can't donate to Annette Tadeo, who is the far more capable, qualified. She's a state senator. Uh, She is she is. Uh, in polling, not only beating Ken by like 50 points, but she is head to head with the Republican incumbent, Maria Elvira Salazar. So she's the real opportunity for the Democrats to flip that seat blue. But yet you have a Republican mayor in Francis who's trying to essentially sabotage the Democrats chance to flip this because because of Ken's ego, meaning donors can't donate to a net because they're being shaken down to donate to Ken. So she's generating which, which is what which is what Suarez promised Ken Russell in exchange for can you just flip flop on the Mel Reese deal? It's not a campaign. It is a criminal quid pro quo. We are watching in public a payoff happening between Beckham Moss, Francis Suarez, and Ken Russell's bullshit congressional campaign. That's all this is. Okay, they got his vote by tricking him into thinking he could with money. His narcissism, his yes. ego would win. I don't know that it matters because he's going to have all this money because you, he can use this money. He doesn't have to return this money if he doesn't spend it and he loses. He has this money. He can live off of this money. He can try to be a kingmaker. This is a guy who, again, calls himself a community organizer but never voted before his name was on a ballot. He won his first election because his opponent dropped out of the race weeks ahead of the election. OK, and now he has basically just been an embarrassment to the city. He has betrayed his constituents. Coconut Grove has fallen. Virginia Key has fallen. It's become the least affordable housing market in the country. This guy has done nothing for nobody except for himself and Francis Suarez and the corrupt special interests and developers in this town. Calls himself an environmentalist, which is a comical outrage. OK, 
And this guy has been, been this guy has done nothing, Dan, but look for another race. Two years into his first elected office, in his first race, in his first election as a voter, this guy announces he's running for Congress. And then he drops out of that race because his, his constituents are like, what about us? Don't you give a shit about the city? You're not going to finish your, your first term in office? You're going to go run for higher office? So he drops out of that race. Then he announces, uh, I'm sorry, then he runs for re-election for the city commission and promises unequivocally, I am here to stay to complete my second four-year term. I'm not running for anything else. Two years later, he's running for Senate in the state of Florida against Val Demings in this Democratic primary. And everybody's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you're, such, you're such a lying rat, a con man, a grifter. So he goes, okay, I'll drop out of that race. And now I'm going to enter the congressional race in the 20... It's, it's on, the guys run for, for three different uh, 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 offices in the last three years. I mean, it's, it's pathetic. And it's, and it's absolute transparent corruption. And the latest is this Yutz advertises an event at actually a great brewery, a very popular place called Titanic next to the University of Miami campus, next to the, the All Cane store, really popular spot, a great place uh, in Coral Gables. And he's got this flyer that it's a University of Miami meet and greet. I don't know how it's University of Miami meet and greet. It's not on campus. It's, you know, it has nothing to do with the University of Miami, but taking up about a quarter or more of the page of this flyer and it's papered all over the campus, it's all over the internet, is the U logo. The, R the orange and green. And I opined on social media, I'm like, did the University of Miami endorse you? Because the, the, the U logo on, on this campaign flyer certainly implies that, and using it without permission is not only a trademark uh, infringement, but it's a, likely a campaign violation. But, but, but Ken would never do that because only a con man, liar, and a grifter would do that. Well, you've called him a yutz and a putz and a liar and a con man and a grifter. And I didn't go straight there. I, it, I mean, no, it, it was a journey, Dan. There. It, it was a journey. It was pretty linear. Let me, let, I, I got to ask a question. Does, does he know anything about law at all? He doesn't know anything about anything. The guy is literally a, a champion yo-yo player and like a paddleboard salesman. That's his, those are his sole qualifications. He's running against a woman who fled to the United States from Colombia after her father, who was a World War II pilot. This is Annette Tadeo. Her father was kidnapped by Marxist rebels in Colombia, financed by the Cuban regime. They flee to the United States. She starts from nothing. She builds a successful small business. Uh, uh, she overcomes adversity left and right and becomes the first... Latina Democrat ever elected to the Florida State Senate. And now she's r running, by all accounts, head to head against the Republican incumbent in the in Florida's 27th district. This is a woman whose credentials are unassailable. None of that socialism, communista bullshit sticks to her with her background, number one. Number two, all of her positions are not just mainstream Democratic positions. Her positions on health care, on abortion rights, on gun control, they're all consistent with the mainstream of Miami-Dade County, the vast majority of American voters, and certainly Florida's 27th Congressional District, okay? This, this guy is just constantly in the way. He has no constituency. The progressive caucus of the Miami-Dade Democrats completely disowned this guy. He has no constituency. He has no base, okay? His base is TikTokers. That's his base, which is fine and well, but it doesn't win an election and it doesn't pay to allow him in collusion with corrupt Republicans to sabotage a, Dem a, a, a race that the national Democrats have already tagged as having real potential to flip a seat back to blue. It's a seat that is traditionally uh, blue. But this guy, I guess, sees my tweet and he immediately deletes the tweet, his tweet with the flyer with the U logo uh, in it. So I don't I, I right away I'm thinking like, well, maybe that maybe that proves my point. He is a con man and a liar and a grifter um, and, and a yutz and a putt. Well, in my eyes, you just did him a favor. So he should do us a favor and come on our goddamn show. You've been calling. You've been asking. You've been uh, you've been searching for him N near far wherever you are.
to make another Titanic reference. Only appropriate, by the way, that this event is at the Titanic Brewery because his campaign is a sinking ship. But I will tell you this. I think that was all that joke already landed poorly when we did the cold open before that is being Wait, kept in. This is your was second that being kept time. In? Yes, you idiot. You told me to keep it going, and then you just <laughs> you yes, it's the second time that joke has made an appearance now. They heard you workshop it because Roy has been rolling since the cold open. This is what I get for testing material in front of a live mic. You didn't, but you didn't get a good response in front of any uh, from any of us. You said it was a dad joke, and then you went in and made it again. There's nobody here. What are you talking? There is somebody driving around, laughing his or her ass off right now as we speak. No, oh, this guy is here. <laughs> That's right. That's my biggest fan, <laughs> right, right there. But Ken Russell reposted a flyer this time without the University of Miami logo, and I'm thinking, huh? I wonder if. He got a cease and desist letter from. I actually tweeted this uh, earlier this week, uh, opining aloud. Did maybe he got a cease and desist letter? And Ken Russell, to his credit, the next day posted this tweet. Point Billy Corbin. I received the cease and desist from the University of Miami. The logo has been blurred to avoid any further action. He actually blurred the logo in the letterhead of the cease and desist letter. And I will tell you. When you have a trademark, you are obligated legally to enforce enforce it. It's like a use it or lose it thing, right? So if you see a violation, the university is obligated to basically say, yo, you can't do that. And this, I will tell you, I want to write a song with the, using this cease and desist letter as the lyrics because it is, it is a sternly worded letter, to say the least. It is absolutely, absolutely brutal. And as Ken Russell himself admits to his credit – is well deserved. Are you reading it now? Are you going to read it for it's, the audience? It's, it's a I mean, long letter. Well, but I don't know. You want you want them to go find gonna, the cease no, and desist? Or you've got the good content? Or are you just telling people that it's a brutal letter? Let's move on to other subjects here because we've got to make room here for Esther Alonzo. Her story is going to make you mad because it's government corruption run amok. But before we do that, uh, I don't know how to make sample ballots interesting, but I'm about to go on vacation. I'm about to uh, vote early, and I just downloaded and printed your sample ballot. So tell the people what they need to know here, because next week is a big week of voting, and if people need to get out there early, give them some guidance here. Dan, this cease and desist letter, you should print this out. This this letter is it's it's so good. It's so good. I might need a moment here to myself, if you don't mind. Uh, it's so good. I'm sorry. Irregardless. Uh, I digress. Are you going to read the letter? Are you going to oh, keep here shitting so around? Good. Are we going to do sample ballots, yeah. the important thing, or are you just going to read a assist, cease and desist letter? So, by the way, early voting is on now. Uh, any of the early voting locations that are open, you can go to in the county. You don't have to go to your precinct or even one in your neighborhood. If you're anywhere in Miami-Dade County and you are a registered voter, you show your ID at any of the uh, two or three dozen early voting centers. Um, and uh, I think they're all open until 7 p.m. this week uh, going through Election Day, which is uh, the 23rd, um, you could go to Miami Beach City Hall and vote and you could bring in your printed sample ballot uh, with you. So you don't have to just memorize all of so some of these are very obscure races and obscure uh, candidates. And if um, people want to get your information, they can do so Instagram and Twitter if, you, if they want the research done for them. Yeah, my current pinned tweet. Uh, is my sample ballot. My current pinned Instagram post is my sample ballot. Um, yeah, I went through a lot of trouble. And for people thinking like, oh, you know, I'm not going to vote the way Billy tells me. There's Republicans on on that list that I've that I've picked. There's a lot of what a lot of local races here are nonpartisan, despite the fact that some of these candidates are, in fact, either registered Republicans or Democrats or and or supported by the parties themselves locally and or nationally. Um, I, I you we're forced in these nonpartisan races to sometimes Hold our nose and and pick the best of the worst. Some of them I'm passionate about, like I'm excited about the candidates that are running, but many of them are just an effort to, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, just save democracy and just spare us from the worst instincts of the far right or the far left. Uh, for that matter, and avoid the extremists, because this ballot is one of the worst I've seen in Miami-Dade history. It is a minefield. It is a cesspool. And if you step on the wrong pile of crap, you are going to set off, uh, I mean, a tectonic shift in, in democracy and in your local government. And these local races, people always pay so much attention, you know, glamorizing and, and, and distracted by these national races, like for president. But the people who affect your life on an hourly basis 
are your local officials, are your city commissioners, your county commissioners. Um, these are the people that really make an immediate impact and difference in your life. So it matters most who you vote for in these in these races, even more so than president. Also on my uh, Twitter, you can find the cease and desist letter that the University of Miami. There, do us that way. Give us a couple of sentences then. The cease and desist letter will be pinned oh. on his Twitter account if you want to read for it yourself. Look at him. Oh. Smelling like the, the way I do when I walk past a bakery. He is sniffing in the cease and desist. Oh. Please stop making those oh, sounds. I'm getting uncomfortable here, fresh, man. Oh. Please stop making fresh, those warm sounds. Pastelitos. Give me a give me a sentence or two oh. from the cease and desist before we lead into this really just brutal, heartbreaking story of something going on in Virginia Virginia Key that shouldn't be going on. Dear Mr. Russell, it was brought to our attention that you are using the University of Miami's name, logo, and trademarks without permission in media press, promotional material flyers, invitations, and other campaign advertising. The University of Miami is the owner of several trademarks, including but not limited to ba, 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 your unauthorized use of university's marks is not only a violation of the university's long-held trademarks, but the use of the university's marks may cause consumer confusion, mistakes, and deception. Persons familiar with the university's marks are likely to believe erroneously that you are authorized, licensed, or sponsored by the university when that is clearly not the case. As the result, oh, it just goes on. It's and just it, boilerplate, it cites, though. It's just uh, boilerplate it, cease and desist. Demand is made that you immediately and permanently cease and This is what it sounds like sensually when Billy wins something. All. all he's won is he got, he's sitting here shouting on street corners every weekend with a, with a megaphone yelling about corruption. And what does, what passes for a victory around here? The University of Miami wrote a but cease and desist to failure, Ken Russell. Your failure to immediately abandon. And uh, will leave the university no choice but to pursue any and all legal Turn and equitable remedies. Turn off his remedies. microphone. Oh, hang this on. is making the, me uncomfortable. The, the last sentence in all caps, please govern yourself accordingly. This is a guy in government, Dan. This is a guy who can't whip two votes on the city commission who thinks he can go. Who he's qualified to go to Congress. I mean, because Miami, man. Always good when Billy gets extra outraged and he's brought in Esther Alonzo here with us so that uh, people can feel how outrageous some of the things that Billy has been claiming for a while. They keep happening around here. We've told you about Joe Carroyo and how he's basically uh, an armed guard for state militia with the way that he behaves with ball and chain in Little Havana. And now you've seen what's happened over the last couple of weeks with Virginia Key. Billy, get people caught up on what we've done the last couple of weeks and how appalling this is what's happened now to Esther Alonzo, the founder of the Virginia Key Outdoor Center. Yeah, City of Miami is my favorite telenovela, this government, but the problem is there are real victims. In this case, Esther and Ball and Chain, as you cited, private businesses that are being uh, that are being retaliated against for political reasons that Joe Carollo is sending out literally armed police officers to sometimes, well, to threaten, to arrest, to uh, in this case, shut down a business and put their employees out of work. Virginia Key is an extraordinary resource. First of all, it is a uh, it is an enclave for all kinds of marine life, turtle, sea turtles, manatees. Um, it has the historic Black Beach that we talked about with Uncle Luke uh, last week. It also has bike trails. It has, uh, it, in fact, in the city of Miami, it's one of the few beaches we have. You realize that city of Miami itself doesn't have the beaches. Miami Beach has the beaches. But here at Virginia Key Beach and on Key Biscayne, that's where the some of the only beaches in Miami are. Esther owns a, a, a business, uh, the Virginia Key Outdoor Center, that rents uh, kayaks, paddle boards, bicycles to locals and tourists alike in the north northern part of the island, home to where the, the famous Jimbo's restaurant uh, used to be for a lot of years. She is actually, in fact, she won a contract from the city through an RFP, a bidding process, um, about seven years ago for this business. The city is her landlord, uh, and all of a sudden... Um, after Joe Carollo announced this homeless concentration camp that he wants to bus all the homeless people over, rezone and redevelop, 
this island property, which, by the way, he's been trying to do since 1985. There it's are a new valuable stories piece to, of land. Value, he wants to put a theme park and condos. In, but first thing he wants to do is blight it and, and of course, rezone it, get all the, the, um, the water and the power and the infrastructure, make a lot of people a lot of money, including himself, but put people like Esther out of business. Because out of nowhere, she came forward, as did the mayor of Miami-Dade, as did the, the county commissioner uh, in, in this district. Everybody came out almost universally reviled this idea of Joe Carollo's and Esther came out as well and so what happens in retaliation the Tantan Makut shows up armed police officers show up at her business last Friday ahead of a what no doubt would have been a busy and lucrative weekend for her and for city of Miami because she pays rent I believe on a revenue share basis so the city of Miami taxpayers benefit when she does well and they shut her down they threatened to arrest her arrest, arrest her employees they cited back rent that she owes all this this stuff and they shut her down and here she is uh trying to save her her business and save most importantly virginia key thank you esther for joining us uh why don't you take us through and tell us what it is that happened to you thank you good afternoon thank well thanks for having me on first of all uh what happened well um i mean in short we got shut down um, we got shut down after um, there were demands for. I'm sorry, I I lost my place. It was um, we got shut down. We you know police came on site, um, code enforcement came on site. Uh, it was a large showing. I was trying to get there to get whatever paperwork I had that I thought was what they needed, and and I didn't get there in time. Um, but they asked us to stop service. And I told my staff, stop. If they're telling you to stop, stop. Uh, one of my my manager, Diana, was uh, she had to sign an arrest affidavit. This is a young woman that's never had any dealings, any criminal dealings at all. She's a wo young woman at the beginning of her, of her life, of her career. And she now has to go to criminal court, um, you know, over a, a zoning violation. And you know, regardless of whether or not there's an issue, if the law in the city of Miami says that you go to go to jail for a zoning violation, for a code violation on a first notice, that's criminal. I mean, I'm not serving alcohol. I'm not putting anyone in any danger. I had my inspections. I've been there for seven years. If there was an issue, I would have thought that, you know, that somebody would have said something and said, hey, you got to fix this. What are you in Even violation meant, of? What are they saying that you're in violation of? Is it back I rent? didn't have a, yeah, they said I didn't have a business tax receipt and a certificate of use. I thought I had a certificate of use. I don't know. I mean, they're saying I have to have a business tax receipt, so I have to get a business tax receipt. I wasn't aware that it was something that I was out of compliance with. Um, you know, we're on city property. It isn't, it isn't private property. And well, that's the point I wanted to ask her. The city is your landlord. You've been operating there for seven years with a lease with the city. So how all of a sudden do they come in? Well, I mean, what are they responsible for? I mean, you're a tenant, right? Is that accurate? I'm a tenant. Right. I'm a tenant and on, and actually on Thursday. So we knew something was up. We knew something was up because sometime in late May, uh, they said that uh, they were going to be putting, um, that our lease was over and we we're going out for bid. And I said, hey, hold on. My lease isn't over because we have all this tolling period uh, that we're entitled to. And originally it was a five-year lease and under waterfront leases, they don't allow anything longer than that. Uh, but there was construction work that was being done on a seawall that was anticipated would take about a year. And in fact, it took about a year to complete. So the, the premise was that there would be an opportunity to toll the lease during that time so that we didn't get, you know, we didn't lose a whole year on a five-year lease. Uh, what we didn't expect was that we would have Irma and that we would have COVID. So during Irma, we had to move from the location because the city was dumping illegally in that very field that's the subject of this whole you know, fiasco. Um, so we moved over to Marine Stadium to this rundown building. And, and honestly, I was happy for the opportunity to just be able to work and give my people work. And people came out because after a hurricane, everybody was like desperate to get outside after being locked up for two weeks. So we were there until almost December and then that's when the boat show or late November, when the boat show starting setting up. And then we had to go back to a regular space, which they were still in the process of cleaning up. Um, so 
we're talking about ever since we started operating there, it's been just one disruption after another. I think maybe the last year is the only time that we've really had an uninterrupted, you know, uh, opportunity to operate. But do you believe that they uh, have any grounds or, or do you you think this is obviously retaliation for you being publicly against what they were going to do yeah. with their project? I, I do, because look. When you're in business and when you have a dispute, you try to come to a resolution. And now now they're saying that I was difficult <laughs> in getting a meeting with them. I had a, mis a, a did meeting at Commissioner Russell's office on August 11th, Thursday that his office facilitated because I couldn't get an in-person meeting with anyone from parks or anyone from real estate to discuss what was coming up. And I don't think it's uh, unreasonable to ask, uh, hey, what's the plan here? How do I plan ahead? What's going on? You know, look, if I had to rebid for the space, I had to rebid. We had been trying to get in front of them to present a proposal. Um, and their response to me was, well, go to the unsolicited bid process, which is a really expensive and drawn out process that still goes to bid. But at the same time, they're getting into all these other deals that are, you know, for profit bid deals. And this is going through our nonprofit that we established. So there was a, a resistance, which, you know, didn't make sense. The, but the, city, is, the city is making a have. the city's making a play, right? I mean, the city's city, making a real estate play for the property now. City's making a play. I'm in the way. Right. Um, all of a sudden, they're reneging on all the tolling periods for and their rent abatement. Right. So then they're claiming, oh, you owe me all this base rent. Well, ironically, um, and I took documents with me to that meeting, and they asked me not to give it to them, but to email them, which I did the next morning, including a spreadsheet. Because on the 9th, after asking many times, on the 9th, I get a list of the payments that they credited to my account. And some of them, there's two types of rent. There's annual rent, and then there's monthly rent. The monthly rent was problematic to begin with. It's not a large amount. It started at 750 for the first year, went to 1,000, and then increased 3% every year thereafter, uh, plus sales tax. And they also add this thing they call a pilot fee, which is payment in lieu of taxes. And I, I looked that up, uh, obviously, after all this closure. And what, what I read is that it's when the federal government reimburses a city for tax revenue they would have lost uh, for the use of the land. Well, the city of Miami apparently has decided that they also apply this to all the leases. But it's not a huge number. It's $70 that increases every year by 3%. So I, I do the calculations. And what I come to find out is that what's actually happened is that I was being overcharged rent. Uh, the, the, we were talking about monthly rent differences, which, again, my claim is that they owe me money. Uh, they owe me uh, credits on the annual rent. And in the last year, there has been such enormous disorder in the real estate department. And even before that, that, you know, I told they, they hired this new person. It's like talking to a, to a, to a debt collector. Uh, when she told me that I said certain things, I said, I didn't say that communicate with me in writing and I'll send it to my accountant and my attorney. I mean, I didn't have an attorney at that point. I, I still don't now I'm in the process of trying to hire someone. Um, yeah, but you have to remember I'm like, and wait people... a minute. I'm not, Esther, people don't know this. I mean, the, the city of Miami has lost nearly 40 professionals who have resigned or been forced out by this government in like the last yeah. less than than two years. And that would be a major news story in any other city with that, with, with their inability to retain, you know, institutional memory and professional talent at, at the city level. Uh, and but of course, the the. Media has made little or no hay of it. But the bottom line is what's happening is you're getting people who are only allowed to come in and stay in the government if they are basically uh, loyal to the regime, uh, you know, and loyal to uh, Carollo. Um, and so you've seen police chiefs come and go. You've seen um, uh, resiliency. I think we've had three in like the last two years. Resiliency people come and go. I mean, it's crazy. Sir, you're looking at this. Well, even even the directors of real estate. I mean, how many have they gone through just in the last two years? I think like three. There's an interim yeah. director right now. But yeah. Esther, you're looking at this. You're Cuban. And does this feel American to you? No. Does this feel like this is, the country no, that you no, came this is, to? This is, this is how we lost our countries. All of our Latin countries have fallen to this type of, of just extremists. And, and, you know, and people have this whole communist, fascist thing. You know, if you really look at them, there is no difference. It's just they behave the same way. They're gangs of bullies. And they come after you and they they take a little bit of something that might be based in, in some grounds and some, you know, reality. And then they spin it 
into this character assassination and accusation and persecution. Because if this was a problem, then why were they going to be discussing anything with me moving forward? When I left that meeting, I left with a with the idea, and I wasn't the only one that had that, that concept, that we were going to be reconciling all the accounts so that we could come up with whatever numbers were. And my annual rent is coming due. They're, now they're asking for reports from years back because apparently they lost those too, but they have them. And so now it's back on me. Yesterday they had a PR person on a Spanish language radio, which I think has really pissed them off <laughs> because I, you know, I'm fluent in Spanish. And she was going on about la señora this and la señora that and this very, oh, but, she, you know, we relied on her. Uh, we looked to her to be compliant with her lease. And I'm like, you relied on me. I relied on you. And for five plus years, it wasn't a problem. For five plus years uh, under the under Director Rotenberg, I didn't have to worry about somebody trying to do me dirty. I, I mean... If I could do something, they would say yes. If I couldn't do something, they would say no. You know, I, I wish in hindsight that I had been more pessimistic and that I had been more cynical and that I had documented every conversation. And, you know, it, it's so frustrating because they're acting in bad faith. Esther, I've, I've seen the video, the surveillance video from your store with the armed, again, not just code enforcement, but armed police. Miami Police Department comes in with yeah. kids and families and your employees um you came you were born in cuba came to the united states with your family when you were five years old after your father was identified by the cuban military as a, a traitor to the revolution uh, yep. how does that make you feel when you watch that surveillance video from your business it makes me feel like there's a fight i need to take on This happened That's how it makes me feel. Some of us have fight or flight. Clearly, I come from a long line of, fly, of fight. So, you know, and, and, you know, it's amazing. Some of the comments, people are like, well, maybe if you shut your big mouth. Yeah, if I shut my big mouth, you know what? We'd all be screwed. That's they, what we would They'd just run you out if you, uh, and you- Me and everyone else. You must be scared, though, too, right? Because this isn't a sure. small fight. Sure. I don't have the resources the city has. You know, when when at 1030 on a Sunday morning, you're receiving a termination letter by email from a director of a department. I mean, yeah, that's normal. Esther, how many people hey, are you know, how many people are you know, out of really, work? Oh, sorry. go ahead. I'm yeah, sorry. I just, no, I'm sorry. I, I just want to know how many people are out of work at your business. I have about 17 employees, including guides. I have about uh, 13 regular employees, either part time or full time. And and right now we're we're working with um, with the community who's really come in support of us, and it's um, it's incredibly moving because I mean I knew people love this island, but I, I didn't expect that they would look at us in the same way, and so it's um, it's very touching, and we're very appreciative of that. But right now it's you know I, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I'm trying to get all my ducks in a row. But I'm not going to stop fighting for this island because this plan is horrible. It's a public park. It isn't just an island. It's a public park. And, Billy, it's actually Miami's only beaches mm. because Crandon is in the county. Right. And this is where working people come. You know, and, and the narrative has changed. Now the elitist comments are gone because we've established that, in fact, it isn't some, you know, elitist paradise. It's actually the working man's paradise. And uh, and so now it's become, you know, I'm the villain. And we have a city that has decided to throw all their resources against little old me. And on one hand, I'm flattered that I made that much noise. And on the other hand, I'm disgusted and I don't want to do business in the city. What is it ever. that you're moved by when you speak of being moved? Just that you feel the support? You feel that yeah. there are people out there on a grass grassroots level that are, are loving you and your business because they know this is wrong? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the support that we've been getting from the community, whether it's an email, my phone, my voicemail, and I apologize to everyone who's called is permanently full. And it's I have yet to receive any messages condemning us. Um, it's people that, you know, have um, that have wrote written statements that have been contacting all of these politicians and telling them that what they're doing is wrong. And it's not because I've asked them to. It's because they feel moved to do so because they value what we've done. And for me, when I came into the space, 
It was incredibly important. It's a public park and I felt a duty to create public access and I've done that. And I've done that successfully. There wasn't another concession there before, before me was Jimbo's. And, you know, it, it's changed. It, it was a place full of family and kids running around and people of all ages. And it was sad when we were there on Saturday, you know, we've been packing up. And in the afternoon where it would usually have been busy, it was a ghost town. There were a few cars over by the bike trails and and a handful of cars in the parking lot and there was nobody there. You know, we talk about these characters like they're in a Carl Hyacin novel, like they're larger than life and, and, and only in Miami and too crazy to be true. But the reality is when you allow this corruption to metastasize, when you allow someone like Joe Carollo to become an authoritarian, to become a, a third world dictator here in Miami, there are real victims. And the victims are business owners, small business owners, their employees. Esther's got 17 people out of work. Ball and Chain had dozens and dozens of people. And all of those people have families, have rent to pay in what is now the least affordable uh, home market in the entire country. Uh, and and where, do, donde esta Mayor Ponzi Postalita? Which, have you heard from anybody? Have you heard from commissioners? Have you heard from the mayor? All, all these people who are friendly to business and, and the environment and, and the beaches. And have you heard from anybody other than the, the community itself coming out to try to uh, uh, help? Have you heard from anyone in City Hall? No, I have not. Hmm. The only one we've heard from is Joe Carollo, who's gone on camera and, you know, uh, uh, done the whole disparaging comments and uh, the whole everything. You know, he didn't send code enforcement, but he's gone on record saying everything is illegal. Everything's illegal. Everything here is illegal uh, that I exceeded my area. He was saying that I had containers. They're the city's containers. And then there was that I built illegally. It may be that the city didn't pull a permit for its own construction. <laughs> at the facility. And I think he thought he was going to stick that on me because it's something for the deck. And I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure on it, but I wouldn't put it past them. And in all honesty, if there's a problem with getting licensing, I wouldn't be surprised if it has to do with that because the county's involved on that end of it. So we're trying to figure out exactly why there was a holdup and, and why, you know, look, if I if you got someone that isn't in compliance and, and I include myself in that, you know, you, you tell them, hey, you're not in compliance. You need to get up to compliance. And then yeah. We work towards it. I mean, that's what this if is. Worst just... worst case scenario, Esther, this is a landlord tenant dispute. The problem is the landlord is the city. And right. what the land, what the city has done with this dictator, Joe Carollo, is has, they've criminalized these disputes when you have them with the city in a situation where they literally and they did this ball. And, the ball and chain owners also own this taqueria restaurant on Calle Ocho. They came in one night, of course, prime time. They wait for the weekend when business is going to pick up and you can generate a lot of revenue just to screw your weekend and to screw your employees and their tips. These are not people living paycheck to paycheck. They're paying. They're living tip cup to tip, you know, tip jar to tip jar. And they came in and they arrested the manager of a bar and taco restaurant. Again, like Esther's manager, someone a young person with a family working a job, trying to make ends meet in this city and no criminal record. And suddenly they're arresting them for going to work at night. It's outrageous. Esther, what kind of uh, what kind of recourse do you have uh, at this point? It's legal. Um, I'm trying to find uh, attorneys to represent us. Uh, there, there are a few folks that are looking at, at the uh, case and seeing how they can help in on a pro bono basis. Um, you know, I'm not poor, but I don't have the resources to fight this. I'm fighting an entire city and, um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that some of those eggs will hatch in the next day or two and that we'll be able to, you know, provide a response to the city and, and move forward. Uh, but for the business, we're packing up and we're moving out because we've been kicked out and unless they change their minds, which, you know, I'm, I'm not counting on that. Uh, we're, we're out there by September 13th. And uh, even today, I get another another email from them asking for, you know, more stuff that they're supposed to have and changing terms that existed before. It's like you you don't get to rewrite everything just because you want to get rid of me. And remember, and, I... and the here here's one thing. The stupid thing is all they had to do was terminate my agreement and tell me to leave. And I would have really had no recourse because it was the end of my agreement and they're within the right to do it even though that's not the way it's done anywhere for a concession. Okay. But they could have done that and nobody would have been able to say anything, but instead they decided to take punitive action and to punish me. 
And that's where the difference comes in. You are punishing me. You're trying to disqualify me from any future business with the city and with any other municipality, because then I would have to disclose that I've been debarred. So don't tell me that this isn't punitive action and that this isn't retaliatory. Because some people are like, oh, this such and such owes 140,000 in rent. Maybe she shouldn't be talking. Okay, I don't know 140,000 in rent. Bottom line is you spoke up, as is your right, and you and this is political revenge. And you're not only going against the city, I hate to tell you, as you know too well from being here your, your entire life, that you're also going against, you know, multi-billionaire developers and the real estate oligarchs that run this town, that own our politicians, and that want that property where your business is. And I'm sorry this is happening to you. Is there any, is there a GoFundMe? Is there any way to help support your 17 employees who are now out of work because of Joe Carollo's corruption and the failure of the state attorney, Kathy Rundle, and the Broward state attorney, uh, Harold Pryor, to do anything about his corruption? We have not set anything up. Uh, I know a few folks have asked if we have it, and I, I don't, I feel weird doing that. I mean, for the employees, I, I, I would love to do that. Um, I already told them uh, whatever I can get from the sale of the equipment, I'll put back towards their salaries because, you know, in a, in a normal situation, you close down, a new operator comes in, and then you have an opportunity to sell the stuff over, and the employees have an opportunity to get hired. Right. Uh, but not here. Oh, so you're selling the kayaks and the bicycles and the wakeboards and that's Well, you, kayaks, paddle boards, yeah. The paddle boards, yeah. I'm going to have to sell everything. Jesus. Esther, you know, I, folks I have am said, let's try to find another location for you to operate. But, you know, I appreciate that. But I don't I don't know of any. And we have bicycles. I mean, we'll do what we can. Yeah. Esther, I would urge you uh, before this airs on Friday to uh, get us some information on a GoFundMe so that the people who are moved by this that would be interested in helping you and your employees could at least do something here so you don't get just run over by train tracks uh, because they can. Thank you, Esther, Thank for you. sharing your story with us. Thank you, and I'm sorry I had a naked man running behind us. <laughs> Congratulations to Fernand Damondi. I believe he is the first two-time guest in the history of Because Miami. Why is he with us here today, Billy? Is it because he does research, he knows uh, where the numbers lead us, and we've got some important voting that is coming up here in short order? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, Fernand, uh, in addition to being a poli-sci professor at the University of Miami, he's the managing partner of Ben Dixon Amandi, which is the nation's leading multilingual and multi-ethnic public opinion research and strategic communications consulting firm. All that to say that we have a crucial primary in the state of Florida next week. And we wanted to update everyone on the state of the, the major races, or I should say the major race, which is, of course, the Democratic uh, primary for governor, which right now the, the front runners are, of course, Charlie Crist. Charlie Crist is the former Republican governor of Florida. This, turned, is, this is fucked up right here. This, turned, <laughs> this history, this, this, this history of Charlie Crist is something to behold. We get nothing but bad people to choose from. So go ahead and give the people his history. Charlie Crist is the former Republican governor turned independent senatorial candidate, turned Democratic congressional candidate, turned Democratic gubernatorial candidate. Do I have that right? Fernand, who says Florida isn't the land of reinvention? He doesn't stand for anything except getting elected however he can get elected. I, I would argue that Charlie Chris saw the writing on the wall before many Republicans did. You've seen a lot of Republicans in the last six years say, I didn't leave the party, the party left me. Charlie Chris was kind of the hipster Republican who said, this is not the party that I joined, that I was a governor representing in, in the state of Florida. And to his credit, he said, I was Wrong. I was I was playing for the wrong team. And now he Fernand, what, what is the polling now? Him against Nikki Freed, the current um, agriculture commissioner of the state of Florida, the only statewide Democrat elected uh, here in Florida. What what is the the state of the race? Well, Bill, I mean, the state of the race by looking at the public and even some of the private polls that some have shared with me suggests that Charlie's going to win this pretty comfortably, actually, on primary day. Uh, by all accounts, he's got a healthy double digit lead anywhere between you know 10 and 12 points that might tighten of course between now and when the last ballots are cast on Tuesday the 23rd but by all indications
he's going to be the Democratic nominee. And, you know, when Dan was talking, the image that came to mind is kind of like Hulk Hogan. You know, he goes from being the hero to the heel back to being the hero. So we'll see if Chris Demania starts again <laughs> on Tuesday for the Democrats if he pulls this out like the indications are he will. Now, he has previously won a Democratic primary for governor. He ran against uh Rick Scott, am I remembering this correctly? It's just name recognition, correct? It's not his actual politics. It's that these names have been in Florida forever. Well, that, I mean, Dan, you're right. That's part of it. Charlie kind of rose in politics on the bet that if he ran a couple of times for statewide office, he would eventually break on through. He did. And name recognition certainly helps a lot. But truth be told, one of the unique things about Charlie is he does have an ability to put together a coalition of support from obviously Democrats, independents, and some, certainly not a majority, not even close, but some Republicans. And if you remember that 2014 race when he ran against Voldemort, he came really, really close to beating Rick Scott in an election year that was really, really bad for Democrats across the mm. country. That was the 2014 midterms where it was basically a Democratic wipeout. But in Florida, ironically, it was the state that was actually a lot closer because Charlie overperformed. By contrast, Andrew Gillum and Bill Nelson lost a state that they probably should have won in 2018. We were the only state in the country in 2018 that didn't perform well with the blue wave. So we'll see if the third time is the charm here for uh, Chris. But, but you set this up so that it's it's not very different. He's going up against a very well-funded demagogue <laughs> you know um he's in in, in a um in a midterm year that is not supposed to go well for democrats particularly in what i would argue is is a i want to say the red state of florida people still want to argue it's purple andrew gillum uh only lost by what thirty two thousand votes against uh uh desantis four years ago so what does charlie christ have to do I mean, his next step, I guess, is choosing a running mate, choosing a, a, an LG, a lieutenant governor that could make some noise on a national scale that could get some donations to come in to go up against DeSantis's war chest. He is a national Republican figure right now. Everybody assumes if he does get a reelected in if he everybody assumes if DeSantis does get reelected in November, he will be the next Republican president and, and, and destroy, uh, you know, uh, Trump. So with what, that kind of money, he can't lose, can he? Right. How does Charlie break through the, the, the DeSantis machine? Well, look, I know you guys hate the politics of sports metaphors, but I can't resist on the Levitard podcast. This is very much, you know, Atlanta 28, New England 3 with uh, 10 minutes left in the third quarter or whatever that storyline was. So is it impossible for Charlie to win? No. Does he have to make up a lot of ground? Yes. But the good news is that the conditions are starting to change, not just in Florida, but nationally. And I think it come down really to one issue the overturning of Roe versus Wade and what that has done, not so much only on the issue of the abortion debate, but rather how it paints a Republican party that is just unhinged so far outside of the mainstream and anti-freedom, that is creating a completely different frame through which voters I think are now looking at the 2022 midterms. So if Charlie runs a smart campaign going into the general and makes a lot of decisions that I think will help him and maybe put the wind at his back, he can pull off an upset. It's not over yet, but the odds are against him. So if he wins, the next big decision is lieutenant go governor. I mean, really, whoever wins, whether it's Nikki Freed or Charlie Chris, that'll be the next big that's the next big press conference. So where where do we go next then? What do the Democrats do to make that kind of noise and start to puncture some holes in DeSantis's armor? You're absolutely right, Billy. And the big problem that the Democrats have, whether it's Charlie who wins or Nikki, right now there is a lot of uh, folks across the pundit class, across the donor class that just don't think the race is winnable. So the race needs to be made national. It needs to be nationalized. It needs to be injected with, you know, a dose of uh, something that says to people, you know what, we are re-energized, we're re-engaged. And I think there is a way to do that with the LG selection. Like presidential campaigns, people do not vote for vice president. They don't vote for LG, but they do vote for what the narrative frame of the election is about. And if you don't put DeSantis on the defensive, if you don't put him in a narrative box where he's having to defend things that he's done that are obviously outside of where the voters are, then I think it's going to be 
he's going to want to play the on friendlier terrain. And I think the way Charlie or Nikki can do that is by picking one person that has emerged in the last couple of weeks on a silver platter for LG. You have just, you've narrowed it down already. To, oh, absolutely. To, yeah. To one person who, well, okay. Don't keep us in suspense. I mean, look, it's it's better to be lucky than good. And Charlie and or Nikki, if she wins, we're going to be handed a very lucky plate here because when DeSantis decided to suspend the duly elected, by the way, twice elected state attorney from Hillsborough County. Oh, Andrew I see Warren. where I see where you're going. Andrew Warren. We talked about this on the show. It happened yeah, like minutes before we went on. So this, by the way, is the first time a governor has suspended a state official that has not been suspended for malfeasance or indictment or any kind of law breaking. It is an illiberal, almost unconstitutional decision of DeSantis extracting political vengeance on someone who simply said, I'm going to defend the rights of women as we test the constitutionality of the overturning of Wade. That now becomes a pick because of his suspension, because he's someone who is also, I think, very qualified to be governor. If God forbid something were to happen to Charlie, if we were to win the race, Andrew Warren nationalizes the race. He makes this race a referendum on the rule of law with Charlie. Charlie would be sending a message and throwing down the gauntlet that this race is about protecting the rule of law. It's about standing up to DeSantis's increasing fascism. And that Charlie will protect the democracy that is what makes Florida and America great, Billy. Well, that is big and bold because what's the conversation nationally is that DeSantis's reelection is kind of a foregone conclusion, whether it's Nikki Freed or Charlie Crist. They are they're swimming against the tide. And that that would shake shit up, dude. I mean, that would get, like you said, Democratic donors nationally. They don't have any, they don't have any other chance other than to surround the cause of Roe versus Wade and turn that into weaponize that. Well, that said, Fernand, you are in the country, the preeminent multilingual consultant and, and polling firm. Very often there's a conversation among the consulting class, particularly with Democrats and Republicans alike, about checking boxes and profiling potential candidates. We need a woman. We need a Hispanic. We need a person of color. This would be a ticket with two white men. Is that problematic? Well, look, I mean, if Andrew Warren was Hispanic, I'd say pick Hispanic Andrew Warren. But it's not what this race is about. Mm. And look, take it from me. I mean, I, I have run statewide campaigns that have been successful because of the Hispanic vote. But that doesn't mean pandering necessarily by just checking a box and putting a Hispanic or an African-American or any other minority on the ticket for the sake of doing so. There is still a way to s communicate to those voters that the candidates value what they're concerned about, that they're engaging in the community. And that can be done, I think, very effectively with Andrew Warren and Charlie Crist, even if it's two Anglo men on the ticket. It's not about playing the ethnic politics of, you know, checking a box, but rather what the campaign is willing to do and fight for and who they're fighting for. And I think if they could make that case, Billy, as Dan says, weaponize this issue, which is the galvanizing issue nationally, then I think they have a real chance to uh, excite people and get others to take another look at this race so that they're gonna open up their checkbooks and say, you know what? People are saying Florida's done. I don't think so. We got uh, Tom Brady Warren on the ticket there, and maybe we can pull off the massive comeback and save the state in the process. That said, I, I mean, that's this is kind of outside the box thinking, and it's the kind of bold move I think the Democrats need to energize not just uh, not just that race, but the entire slate. Because Andrew Warren was was in fact politically uh, fired by. The governor removed from his duly elected office, twice elected in one of the largest counties, Hillsborough, in the Tampa Bay area, one of the largest counties in the state of Florida, uh, because he said, I'm going to defend the rights of women to have and their and their doctors to make decisions about their bodily autonomy, uh, as well as as trans uh, people in the state of Florida. Um, and but not only that, he could stand up there on a slate with Val Demings, who is running against Marco Rubio. She is not only a woman of color, but she is a retired police chief. So suddenly the Democrats are out there as the law and order party with a former police chief, with a former prosecutor saying we're taking a stand against the lawlessness, the anarchy, the authoritarianism and the fascism of a Republican Party that think that there is no rule of law anymore. That would be wild, dude. Yeah, I mean, the, the one quality I've learned over the years, what gets people to vote for you and excited about you is when they think that you're going to go out and fight for them and defend their interests. 
And this kind of a move, and I'll admit, you know, it is a little bit unconventional. It is a little bold, but I don't really think it's that unconventional or that bold because fundamentally, as you said, Warren is a twice elected state attorney, very respected, has a great record. He's also a young generational contrast to Charlie. It makes all the sense in the world and it puts Florida back in play. And if you're a Democrat or someone that is concerned about DeSantis's encroaching authoritarianism, this is the type of move that's going to get the blood flowing and the juice is pumping so that you can maybe do something and try and knock off uh, DeSantis, who's got a lot of the advantages. Right. Whoever it is, we have to eliminate this thought that that the outcome of the Florida governor's race is a foregone conclusion. And to basically say if the Democrats are going to go down, they're certainly going to go down fighting and they're going to they're going to make a real play at winning this race and not make some kind of safe uh, you know, decision about the the LG. Fernand continues to just speak to our audience with blood flowing and juices pumping and Tom Brady comebacks. He just <laughs> tries to reach our audience. Thank you for trying to bridge the divide. He, he wants to be the first three time guest on this Because is, Miami. Uh, we appreciate it, Fernand. Thank you for being on with us, sir. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Billy.